Greetings, everyone. You are tuned in to the Maria Cosette Show, where the left brain meets the right. I have such a fantastic man on the set today. He is so interesting in his profession, what he does, and his philanthropic ventures. So stay tuned for that interview. And of course, for any further information about the show, visit MariaCosette.com. Stay with us. You're back and my guest today is a highly respected and accomplished physician and philanthropist. Welcome Dr. Andre Panosian. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Thank <laughs> you for being here. And we're going to talk about all the amazing things that you're doing. But first and foremost, if you can tell me your educational and professional background, why you, you know, pursued the field of medicine. Sure. So I uh, uh, grew up in Los Angeles, specifically in Glendale. All my Early years of education were in Glendale, and uh, uh, afterwards uh, I went on to UCLA, where nice. I uh, finished uh, four years of uh, college. From there, I uh, traveled east. I went to the East Coast. I did my medical school training at Tufts University, and then later on, I came back to Los Angeles to complete a, uh, a six-year plastic surgery residency at USC. Intense. Intense, yeah. Fight on. Fight okay, on. Okay, because I was going to say I won't hold Bruins against you. I know. I'm, I'm a little bit of Bruin yes, and Trojan. So I love it. I'm, I, I like mixing it. it up a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so uh, as it happens, uh, nowadays a lot of people who after training, they like to do a little bit more training. I was, I have a, a, a wide imagination and interest, so I, I continued and did additional training in Toronto after that wow. in um, pediatric plastic surgery. So really focusing on kids with uh, deformities, with trauma, burns, uh, unusual problems usually. Um, and so I did that and, I, and as if that wasn't enough, I went to Boston Children's after that <laughs> to you do another uh, fellowship there in a very, very tight niche um, world of something called vascular anomalies, which are unusual and sometimes uh, devastating problems that children can be born with. Uh, some people like to call them vascular birthmarks. So. I see. I see. Very yeah. interesting. Wow. And so let's talk about mending kids. Philanthropy mm -hmm. is driven by the right brain mm -hmm. and you've done incredible work with this organization. So mm -hmm. tell me about that. So Mending Kids is a nonprofit organization that actually started out of Malibu in 2007, thereabouts. And that was about the time when I uh, finished all my training and I had started at, uh, on staff at Children's Hospital here in, in Los Angeles. So uh, as I was on staff there, the organization wa essentially reached out to our department and wanted to bring kids to, from all over the world to Los Angeles to have their treatments done there. Very complex surgeries, things that just can be accessed in their, right. their native countries. So they started coming uh, initially to us. And then as I worked with the organization year after year, it, uh, it, the, the uh, concept evolved. So we started going out to other countries uh, to do the work there, which actually makes a whole lot more sense, financially speaking, um, uh, for the organization. So that's how it all came about. Um, I've been very fortunate to be with them. I'm currently on their board of directors. Um, and uh, we've initiated the Armenia mission, which is a big highlight of my whole career, which is fantastic. They have demonstrated such commitment to the Armenian people, especially now that their offices are in Glendale. Wow. They, uh, they actually um, uh, tap into the uh, Armenian culture quite a bit these days. So I'm very happy and proud to have Yerevan as our uh, destination mission. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for introducing Armenia to the organization. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> And so you have gone on a number of clinical missions, namely Armenia, mm -hmm. Africa, Haiti. And so, um, you know, tell me about your experiences there. You managed to also photograph them. Mm -hmm, so tell mm -hmm. me about uh, all those adventures. Yeah. So I uh, have always wanted to travel, whether it was being a doctor or some other profession. I always wanted to travel and do my work wherever I was going. Right. So when I thought about professions, and I really love the art of medicine. Um, but within the art of medicine, you can't do everything, obviously. You have to choose a specialty. And one of the specialties that really stood out was plastic surgery for me for that reason. Because I can go to those countries and operate on healthy people, specifically healthy children, and really kind of change their lives in a meaningful way. Uh, it's a very happy profession. So I'm able to take that skill that I've developed over the years and 
uh, take it to these countries and really kind of um, hopefully have their doctors learn a few things from me as well in terms of bringing this expertise that's lacking in, in these countries. So that's, what it, uh, that's where it comes from. And so I, I started out very early on, even in residency, by doing some of these philanthropic missions. I went, my very first trip was to Ecuador. And, we, and it's at the uh, uh, western border of the uh, Amazon jungle. So we were actually right there in the Amazon basin. Wow. And uh, we did uh, a surgery on kids who essentially you know, didn't have access to a doctor for a day's walk or something like that. And so oh we, were, we were doing these complex reconstructive problems there. Fast forward, after uh, um, I finished all my training, I continued that tradition. I started going to different places, South America, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, uh, Africa, Haiti's a big uh, destination for me as well. So, and of course, Armenia. So all of these um, uh, different uh, locations really uh, kind of serve the purpose of uh, my initial intention of becoming a doctor or traveling and practicing what I uh, learn to do. Yeah, it's so. beautiful. It's yeah. beautiful. And so you said the art of medicine. So, you know, plastic surgeons utilize creativity in a very unique way in that, you know, our brain's plasticity allows us to create and transform and adapt. And we typically create in a relaxed setting, you know, in our leisure mm -hmm. time, but you guys have to do it in high pressure situations, mm -hmm. often challenging environments, like you mentioned. And so, you know, how do you see creativity playing a role in medicine, especially plastic surgery? Well, I think plastic surgery is the ultimate in creativity and Isn't medicine. It? I know, it it's really so is. artful. It really yes. is. I think uh, the, the highlight, uh, the, the actual um, types of surgeries that we, we do in plastic surgery highlights the fact that any one of those surgeries can be done in a number of ways. It's not right. that you have one, strictly one way of doing something. You can do something in a variety of ways. It's almost uh, as though you have a, a tool bag and you reach into that tool bag and you grab an instrument and then you use that instrument. It might be that instrument that one time for that one person or it might be a different instrument for the same person right. another time. So it just really uh, uh, changes a little bit uh, from person to person. But the idea is that creativity is, always, is infused throughout plastic surgery. You can't um, just kind of read a book and start doing it. You have to have a sense of art, artistic sense about you. You have to have a, a, a sense of uh, the human anatomy and proportions and uh, what is aesthetically appealing to the human eye and essentially incorporate all of that into the actual technical skill of using a scalpel, using right, a, a, right. a needle, a stitch, and, and so forth. So yeah. that's where that creativity comes Yeah, from. it definitely um, demands vision, mm -hmm. that's for sure. And so you have a number of innovative techniques and mm -hmm. approaches. Tell me about that. So there's uh, uh, different things that I do in my uh, profession as a plastic surgeon. So every plastic surgeon will kind of gravitate towards one subspecialty or another, or a niche, if you will. For me, it's I have lots of interests. So that's the, uh, focusing on one thing is almost always hard for me. But one of the things that I really uh, kind of took to and it really um, satisfied the creativity and technical complexity that I always wanted to have in my career uh, was facial paralysis reconstruction. So people who have had things like Bell's palsy, um, a variety of conditions that can result in facial paralysis either on one side or both sides. Kids right. born with something called Mobius syndrome, which essentially they are, have a complete lack of expression on their faces. And, and that these are the sort of things that I will deal with. And one of the techniques that I have developed and sort of refined over the last uh, decade or so um, involves using a, a muscle inside the uh, scalp here and redirecting that muscle for the purposes of smiling. So in other words, when we reorient that muscle and connect it to the mouth, when the child or the person bites, they trigger the, the mouth to go up in, in a, and they can essentially have amazing. a smile. God. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's life-changing. Yeah. That is uh, fantastic when a, a person is actually starting to smile and there was absolutely no hope uh, How before. rewarding for you. Yeah. yeah. It's really fantastic. Yeah, it really, really is. What a gratifying profession. Um, 
And so, you know, so you have this artistic vision and you're good with your hands, of course, because you're a surgeon. Mm -hmm. Your wife told me, your lovely wife, Jill, <laughs> shout out to Jill. Um, she told me that you managed to single-handedly refurbish a classic Porsche. So how did that come about? <laughs> well, you know, it, it's funny because uh, anyone I've, I've told this story to thinks that I'm a car guy, which is absolutely not true. I, I just, I don't like cars <laughs> in general. Really? Okay. I, I like my car, right. but I don't like car. I, if you ask me anything about a Ferrari or Lamborghini or whatever other car, I have no idea. But if you ask me about the Porsche 911, You're like, I know I, it I'll inside tell you from out. inside out yeah. everything there is to be uh, to know, including history and why something is in one place or another. Right. And so, um, so yes, yeah, so I uh, have a vintage uh, Porsche that essentially all of them are 20 plus years old at this point, and uh, at least the older ones. And and so they need some work, they need some maintenance, and it's not uh, ex exactly the cheapest hobby to have. However, um, y you start to tinker with it, and you start doing little things at first, you know, the simple things, oh, change the wiper blade, maybe change the oil on the cart, stuff like that, and then you get a little bit more adventurous, and you think, okay, well, I operate on human beings, how hard can this be, right. really? So then I start taking apart things like the interior, and then the wiring, and the fuse box, and then I get a little bit more adventurous. I say, well, let me reseal the engine. And so I drop the engine and I pull it out and I, that is so I cool. open up the whole engine and I start changing out things. And it's really quite um, satisfying, but it's also very logical, which actually appeals to me as well. So right. uh, it's, and it's beautiful. It's, it's amazing, the engineering that goes into these uh, cars. And so you, you really see how the pieces come together, why the alignment has to be within fractions of a millimeter to make that engine work correctly. Right. It just blows your mind. So I, d I decided I'm going to start pulling things apart, making it new so that I can drive it every day. So uh, these cars have potential issues and they can be in the shop all day long, all year long in, in that sense. But um, I just thought, I just want to do it myself. I can do this, it's enjoyable. I, sp I don't have to go out, out of the house to do it. I just do it right there in the garage. So yeah. uh, that's where that all came from. And yeah, so from front bumper to back bumper, it's all been refurbished uh, inside and out. Oh my gosh, it's pristine. I'm so. sure it is, I'm sure it is. I mean, look at how you have excelled in all the other facets of your life. So I'm sure that Porsche came out to be beautiful, yes. <laughs> And so I must ask you um, mm -hmm. this question I ask all my guests in that, why do you think it's important for professionals to exercise both sides of the brain and to have a creative outlet? So uh, I think I th as far as doctors go, everyone needs a hobby in general. Forget about doctors, everybody. Everyone needs a hobby, an outlet um, uh, that is not work in my mind. Some people make work their hobby. And, uh, and um, that's fine. However, for me, I, I like to step away, you know, put the white coat down for a little bit and really kind of get dirty and, and really explore things. I have a lot of interests, a lot of hobbies, and it's, a, it, it's a, an emotional outlet. It's a creative outlet. Uh, working on the car is one, one way I do that. And the other thing is photography. I really enjoy uh, manipulating light and shadows and patterns and, um, and really kind of dialing in the camera the way I want the shot to look. And, and it's fascinating. I can make the same picture look completely different in the same light from one extreme to another uh, just by knowing the, the, uh, the, the facets of how to, how to change the, the various parameters of a camera. So, uh, but what that sort of highlights is the fact that we as human beings need hobbies. We need to exercise that right brain a little bit uh, and, to, and to feed the beast, if you will, in, in that sense, and in, in, in a way calm the beast. And so that's, why, that's the way I uh, envision uh, what the importance of creativity in life is. Art is one of these things, and visiting museums, uh, uh, even enjoying your children. Right. And, and these are the the creative outlets that I see in my life, and I, I, I would never do without them. Yeah, beautifully said. You need a brain break. I mm -hmm. asked some uh, physicians, I know I say physicians because I've worked in healthcare in the past, and you're a physician, mm -hmm. and you know, some physicians I ask, 
you know, what is your creative outlet? They're like, I don't have any time for it. I'm like, how? But how? You need a brain yeah. break. And then some are just absolutely fascinating and their patients have no idea. Mm -hmm. But like you, they have all these different things going on. So yeah, it, it was such a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate you coming on Thank the you very much. It's yeah. an honor to be here. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course, my pleasure. And so stay tuned for more of the Maria Cosette Show. to create along with nature. To masterfully blend subtle flavors. To trust time in the making of history. to share everything we are proud of. Ararat, from heart to heart. The Art of Giving, where we spotlight a nonprofit organization. A group of thoughtful, committed citizens came together in 1971 to create Greenpeace. A handful of determined activists leased a small fishing vessel and set sail from Vancouver for Alaska with a mission to protest U.S. nuclear testing with a brave act of defiance. Greenpeace is a global independent campaigning organization that uses peaceful protest and creative communication to expose global environmental problems and promote solutions that are essential to a green and peaceful future. They have been campaigning for a green and peaceful future for 40 years now. They defend the natural world and promote peace by investigating, exposing, and confronting environmental abuse, championing environmentally responsible solutions, and advocating for the rights and well-being of all people. Their current initiatives include saving the Arctic, protecting forests, fighting global warming, protecting our oceans, living toxic-free, promoting sustainable food, and defending democracy. Get involved in saving the world. Visit greenpeace.org. I'm here with Dr. Ruben Adalian, director of the Armenian National Institute and the curator of today's exhibit. How are you? Very good. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what is the process, um, the curation process, what does it entail, and how did you obtain these wonderful and riveting images and the journal entries? Well, from a number of sources. The primary one was the uh, elder family themselves. Uh, they happened to donate a good many of these pictures uh, some time ago, giving me the opportunity to study them, examine them, and I'm trying to understand what the story that they tell. And, and further uh, discussion with the family as, we, as I try to connect the pieces together, as well as discovering that uh, John Elder, who's the primary photographer who, who made these pictures, also wrote a memoir. And so I compared the memoir with the photographs and, and sequenced it in a way that he experienced uh, the one and a half years that he lived in Armenia between January 1918 and August 1919, the most critical years of the First Republic of Armenia. He was there at the birth of the First Republic of Armenia. So he witnessed the Armenian nation, the rebirth of the Armenian nation, and that's what he documented. At the same time, he was because he was a YMCA uh, worker, he was a trained relief uh, uh, specialist, and he threw all of his energy in helping the Armenian refugees, the Armenian orphans, he ran hospitals, he did just unbelievable amount of work. By the time he was done, the Armenian government had credited him and his colleague, uh, uh, James O. Errol, with probably having saved the life of a close to 100,000 Armenians.
we created this community where um, our members are a lot more passionate about Armenian in the politics, or how to help our community, who to engage with, um, who to connect with, how to expand their circle. So I feel like it's it's events like this that's steps for a, a greater Armenian youth. Yeah, absolutely. And then how can people check out the exhibit? So the exhibit is going to be going on for two weeks. It's going to be at CSUN and we are, uh, CSUN ASA is also hosting. So whoever wants to come as a group, we're going to have a tour guide and we're going to go throughout the entire exhibit, explain um, each step of uh, the relief agent's journey. This is a really a special event to have the YMCA volunteers in 1918 be so impactful with uh, the Republic of Armenia back during the war, to learn about that, to learn about the, the volunteerism, and then to have this display of all the history that was given to Ruben for him to put this together. It's very impactful. I'm truly overjoyed to see this wonderful crowd here today uh, to come and pay homage to John Elder and James Errol, uh, volunteer American YMCA relief workers uh, who were in Armenia at one of the most uh, bleak moments in Armenian modern history. Uh, but they were also there during uh, a, a period where we had and they witnessed the battles of Sardarabad and Bash Abaran and Gara Kilise. And they were there when, when uh, we won battles in Sunik and in Artsakh. They were Americans on the ground helping vulnerable refugees. They were helping genocide survivors, a lot of orphans. Um, come back to life, basically. So, I mean, they, they truly were lifesavers. It's just a great story, right? I mean, I, you know, I love to bring historical uh, exhibits into the gallery, right? It's, a, it's an, an art gallery, but we like to occasionally throw in, you know, bring in nice stories such as this. And, you know, we're excited about it, and we, and we know that if people come up and they'll see the gallery, and then they'll come back. That's what we like. It's a pleasure to see you. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Likewise, it's a pleasure to see you too. Thank you. So most recently, there was a $2.1 million donation, anonymous donation, I should say, made to the Armenian Studies program. What can students expect from the program? What is it comprised of? Uh, first of all, uh, we are going to start implementing certain programs uh, thanks to this uh, very generous, uh, significant donation. Uh, the focus will be on Armenian art and Armenian culture, uh, meaning uh, we're going to have exhibits, we're going to invite uh, guest lecturers uh, to speak about some specific aspects of Armenian culture and art. Also, we will be able to uh, invite visiting professors, like uh, on a semester basis, to come and uh, teach a particular aspect of Armenian culture. We also have uh, uh, associations, uh, uh, relations with the library, uh, Oviat Library. Uh, we have started collecting material documents uh, from the pre-genocide period and we're going also to focus on documentation uh, relating to Armenian immigrant experience in Los Angeles. I must say that there are a lot of events that I cover, but there are some that just leave a lasting impression. Today was one of them. Thank you to the Armenian National Institute and the Armenian Assembly of America for allowing me to be here and cover this very valuable event for the Armenian American community. Know the Greats, where we spotlight a legend. Rachel Carson is regarded as the founder of the modern environmental movement. She studied biology at Johns Hopkins University. And after working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Carson published Under the Sea Wind, along with many other books. This first release was a gripping account of the interactions of the seabird, a fish and an eel, who shared life in the ocean. She was a student of nature and born ecologist long before that science was defined. Her most famous work, however, was 1962's controversial Silent Spring, in which she described the devastating effects that pesticides were having on the environment. 
Carson asks hard questions about whether and why humans had the right to control nature, to decide who lives and who dies. She became a social revolutionary, and Silent Spring became the handbook for the future of all life on Earth. Perhaps the finest nature writer of the 20th century, Carson is remembered more today as the woman who challenged the notion that humans could obtain mastery over nature by chemicals, bombs, and space travel. The world needs more Rachel Carsons. Well, that's a wrap for the Maria Cosette Show. What a fantastic episode. I had such a great time chatting with Dr. Andre Panosian. Please check out all the amazing work he's doing with Mending Kids, such a worthy organization. And of course, for any further information about our show, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram. Until next time, everyone, you stay creative. I'm out.